I want to talk to you about how I learned Japanese. This is Steve Kaufman again. If you enjoy my videos, please subscribe, click on the bell for notifications. So, you know, how did it come about that I learned Japanese? Japanese ended up being very influential uh, in my life, my social life, my professional career. Uh, and yet, you know, back in 1968, I was sent to Hong Kong by the Canadian government to learn Mandarin Chinese. So I, how did I end up with Japanese being such a dominant language in my life? So I thought I would go over that and go over with you some of the sort of things that helped me learn Japanese. And more than any book or anything, as I sort of reflect back on it now, it was my attitude. Uh, and of course, the amount of time that I was prepared to spend on learning Japanese. So, 68, I go to Hong Kong, I spend a year learning Chinese. Um, and then the idea was that I would be working in the uh, Canadian High Commission in Hong Kong using my Chinese. Unfortunately, there developed a sort of a, a conflict, a personality conflict or whatever, with my immediate boss at the High Commission. And the idea was that uh, Canada would open up a, an embassy in Beijing and I would be working for this person. Uh, it would be a very isolated posting. He and I didn't get along, so I announced to the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service that I refused to go to Beijing to work under this person in an isolated post. Life would be held for two and a half years. I said, on the other hand, since the government had paid for me essentially to learn Chinese, which I had done in, in uh, you know, quick time in, in, a, in a year, whereas normally two years was sort of the allotted time to learn Chinese. I said, I will, if you assign me to Japan, I will learn Japanese on my own, won't cost you a penny, and you will have at least gotten some return on your investment. Which, looking back on it, is, is kind of a, almost a foolhardy thing for me to do, but I was not prepared to go and spend two years in an isolated post with someone with whom I had very strong personality conflicts. And in their wisdom, the Trade Commissioner Service agreed. So I then started buying books in Hong Kong on Japanese. And uh, I still remember that one of the first things I learned was uh, how, do, how, you, how you say, uh, how do you do when you meet someone for the first time? And the expression was, o me ni kakarete taihen koe ni zonjimasu. All right. I learned that. I sort of memorized it. I have never used that expression. Nobody uses, nobody uses that expression, a completely useless expression. It's an indication that much of what you get in beginner books may not be all that useful. You have to be prepared to, you don't necessarily eliminate it, but you learn it and forget it and you don't worry about it. Anything that's thrown at me at any stage in my learning, it's not really important to me whether I am able to hang on to it. In time, I'll figure out whether I need it or whether I don't. Now, in the case of Omenika Karate Taihen Koe Nizonjimas, not something that I ever needed. So while in Hong Kong, because I had friends amongst the various other diplomats who were studying Chinese, I had very good friends amongst the uh, people at the Japanese consulate. And one of those people was very fluent in uh, Chinese and uh, he wanted to learn English. So we would meet for lunch twice a week at a very famous uh, dim sum place in Hong Kong, the uh, Luk Kok Hotel. And uh, Tuesday we would speak English and Thursday we would speak Japanese. I don't know what I was able to say. Whatever I was able to find in my book, I would trot it out. It wasn't much of a conversation, but it was part of starting to experience things Japanese. So then in, uh, I guess, January of 71, we moved to Japan and I went to a school right under the Tokyo Tower called the Nitoguri uh, Nihongo Gakko, Japanese school. Nitoguri Sensei was a very charismatic man and his message was kokoro to kokoro, heart to heart. And we would sit around 
in this classroom, five or six of us, and we would all try to mumble something in Japanese. And I did that for a month and then I realized that this was largely a waste of my time. So I quit that and I started doing a lot of reading. I, led a, I read a lot in, in this series by Naganuma, which I mentioned before, which is all hiragana. Because since I had the characters from Chinese, I had to get used to the kana. And even though compared to Chinese characters, hiragana is easy to learn. There's only whatever it is, 50 symbols. Never underestimate how difficult it is to get used to a new writing system. Even though theoretically you know what the symbols represent, before your brain gets used to absorbing, you know, messages, information with that writing system takes a long, long time. So I read lots and I listened to lots and uh, continue to scour the bookstores for reading material wherever possible with cassette tapes, much more difficult at that time to find such material, but whatever I could find, I consumed. I was lucky enough that uh, at the Canadian Embassy where I was working, I had an assistant, commercial uh, officer as they were known, the sort of locally engaged staff who worked with the trade commissioners, who had the contacts, who would accompany you to visits. And his name was Nick Yazaki, and he was extremely long-winded and extremely patient. And he would speak to me and he would say everything four or five times and I would listen to him and I would imitate his the way he droned on and repeated things. But when you're learning a language, if you are lucky enough to have someone to talk to who is, a, you know, long of wind and repeats things, that's extremely helpful. And with Nick, we would go and visit, uh, you know, potential, uh, you know, contacts, people who wanted to buy uh, Canadian products. Uh, first two years, I was promoting food products. In the second two years of the four years, I was promoting forest products. And we would visit with Japanese contacts and um, I would kind of hang in there. But, you know, and I try to say something and I pretend that I understood it. And I think this was the other attitude that I had. It, it never bothered me that I, for the longest time, didn't understand 100%. I understand 30%, 40%, 50%, but I'd be in there nodding part of the deal. After the meeting, I'd ask Nick, like, what exactly did they say? I, maybe I said something that was totally irrelevant. It, it never really bothered me. Uh, I was in a Japanese environment. I was being exposed to the language. I was picking up on things. And, but it does take a long time. And I can remember that even after years of living in Japan, the only television programs that I could understand were baseball and sumo because there's, you know, the dialogue is relatively limited. Uh, you're seeing what's happening. So that was kind of what I would watch. It took me a long time before I could understand, you know, uh, drama, you know, soap operas or sword movies or slash movies or any of that stuff. Uh, it just takes a long time, but I was in a hurry. I certainly didn't want to write any exam in Japanese. I just wanted to use it to the extent that I could use it. And, and where my Japanese really took off was when I uh, left the embassy and I started working on my own. So now I didn't have a Nick Yazaki. Uh, I had to basically, you know, handle these relationships by myself. And uh, there were times, uh, and I had Japanese people working with me, and we'd be in the car driving around the Kansai for hours in traffic and just talking, 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 talking about lumber, I'm talking about, and of course, the Japanese wood business is quite fascinating, and, and I had to learn about how they cut the trees, the logs, and how they cut for different grade, for different grain, for different qualities, the different, uh, you know, idiosyncrasies of wood that they didn't like or did like, and, and we could talk forever about wood. Mostly we just talked about wood, but we talked for hours. And I also had a customer, but we didn't only talk wood. I had a customer when I was working for a major, again, Canadian forest products export company. I had a customer in Nagoya. We were also selling newsprint. And the Chunichi Shimbun in Nagoya, which is the major newsprint in Nagoya, a newspaper in Nagoya, they had a purchasing manager. And I had to go and, and be nice to him so that they would continue buying our paper. And I would go down there once a month and we would sit in a Japanese restaurant, sit on the floor and uh, consume a bottle of whiskey and discuss philosophy. So I had to be up on subjects related to philosophy. We didn't talk about the price of newsprint. We didn't talk about anything related to business. We talked about philosophy. 
which was a lot of fun. And uh, I mean, I can't remember all the different things, but my, my basic attitude was one of just, you know, roll with the punches. Um, and, and I would go in and find readers with glossaries and, and for the longest time, when I saw a Chinese character, I would pronounce it to myself in Chinese and um, very often not know how that was pronounced in Japanese. I, I, there were like, I would hear it and I knew what it meant, but I didn't necessarily relate that character to any particular pronunciation. So I would read in hiragana, pronounce it in Chinese, continue reading in hiragana and acquire this vocabulary. Now, this has all be, become much easier today because we have text-to-speech, we can look up words in dictionaries, we can, uh, we have, like at Link, we have Furigana, the little Hiragana guys on top of the characters. It's just so much easier. It's unbelievably much easier, even though, you know, at Link is not perfect because the word splitting algorithm doesn't quite work as well as we would like, and we're looking at ways to make it better, but it's still so much easier to learn today than it was back in those days. So. Uh, and, and I should say amongst the ver uh, various sources that I would listen to when I got into my car in Tokyo in August when it was like 36 degrees and the sun has been beating down on my car and I get in there and the steering wheel is just like scalding hot and I would put on my Showa no Kiroku, the history of the Showa era, which I must have listened to 20, 30 times. So it's all, I think my immersion in Japanese was one of, I wanted to explore I wanted to experience the language. I'd say what I thought I was able to say. Sometimes you get it wrong, didn't bother me. I'd listen to what people were saying to me and basically relied on my brain to gradually start saying more and more things correctly. I never really focused in on the grammar, grammar rules, rules about you know when to use which polite form, none of that. I just basically allowed the language to come to me and trusted that my brain would pick up on the patterns of the language. And today, my Japanese is as it is. It's not perfect. Uh, I don't, I haven't tried to zoom in on any particular, you know, aspects of either polite language or pitch accent or any of these other things. I communicate, I understand, I'm happy, it serves my purposes. And I think people uh, are quite comfortable communicating with me in Japanese. And you can watch two of my videos in Japanese here just to give you a bit of the flavor of my Japanese as it is right now. Which reminds me, I just wanted to say one more thing. Learning other languages and having an absence from Japanese has improved my Japanese. In other words, the fact of learning other languages and particularly the 10 languages I've learned since the age of 60, including Russian, including, you know, Korean, Ukrainian, and now struggling with Arabic and Persian, all of that is good for the brain and actually improves my Japanese. Although if I haven't spoken it for a while, I'm initially quite rusty, but then ultimately I become better. So there you have it. Uh, a brief discussion of how I learned Japanese. I hope that's helpful.